Welcome to another edition of Dog Talk and Coffee with me, Richard Hines. Okay. Oh. Here you come. Sit. Down. Down. Oh. All right, today I'll be talking about how to pick a puppy properly, whether it's a pet dog, service dog, or protection dog. So I'm going to go through those three categories, which all have a beginning similar base, and then I'll discuss the differences throughout the three categories, stemming off of that particular base that we're looking for in a puppy. All right, so as we are going to start evaluating the litter, we want to do this individually, meaning we want to take a puppy out by themselves, each one individually with you, not as a group, okay? That's a big mistake. So, when you do things as a group, puppies act differently when they're with each other, okay? So, you may get a false read, highly possible. Okay, one-on-one, -on -one, what we want to see is when we bend down, we want to see a puppy confidently come to us, right? Wagging its tail, hopefully, and there's no hesitation getting right there to us and getting on us and loving us up and, okay, all that. That is the first rule. When you have puppies in a group, because they feed on each other, weaker ones will follow the stronger ones and look like they're normal. And it's only because they're following and have the support of the tougher ones the more stable ones. So it's very common, you pull out a whole bunch of them and you get down, you go like this and the balanced ones with good stable temperaments will start just coming to you happily and the followers just follow and they get in there and follow what they do and looks normal. They get in there with you and, you know, <laughs> hang out there as a normal puppy wagging their tails, but pull out individually and you may see a completely different thing from some of those puppies, okay? So we want to see that just outright confidence that they want to come and socialize and with no hesitation, right into us, okay? Wagging, happy, go lucky. What I don't want to see is a puppy hesitating this, not sure, choosing between going to you and maybe somewhere else because they're just torn between it. They're not sure if they want to go to you. They're a little timid. You know, no crawling into you and cautiously getting into you even if they do follow through, right, and choose you over the environment. We don't want to see like hesitation crawling into you and kind of cowering in there, but they got there. Then you're petting them and then they start to wag their tail, but they're very timid and submissive, okay? Don't want to see that. For most of the public, 
they don't know how to raise puppies properly and understand what goes into balancing a puppy. Okay, so this creates a lot of behavior problems later. Most aggressive dogs are fear-based dogs and it starts like that, right? The people picking the weaker one, the little submissive one, oh, how cute, oh, right? Not realizing that this is going to be a nightmare a year from now. <laughs> so from raising it a certain way unintentionally, people enhance the fear and cowardice of these dogs and then they become very insecure, snappy, possibly biters, right? Fear biters, afraid of everything, the world, and becomes a nightmare to live with. So these are your indicators, young, of how to avoid this issue. So again, we don't want a puppy that comes out and has environment to choose over, or you, and they just choose the environment. <laughs> That's first. Now, on that, you can get puppies who are just curious and are out and it's not a temperament thing, right? They're just not interested in you in the moment. But the moment you do get to interact with them, there should be stability and no fear, okay? Another thing about a dog who separates from you and really wants nothing to do with you, I wouldn't choose that one either, being indifferent because you could get a dog who's just either alpha type just doesn't care about you at all doesn't care <laughs> leads his own way and a lot of times those puppies are just for most people they want a dog that really wants to interact with them and love them up, right? That's why most people get a dog. A lot of puppies who are indifferent like that throughout their lives just don't really care so much about interaction with the owners, okay? So those are the two things about a dog who's torn that doesn't want to go to you and you can tell is timid and being torn between getting away from you that's trying to interact with them or one who just doesn't care and wants nothing to do with you. And even when you start interacting with them, they're not timid, but they just don't care, and then they walk away and go do other things. So a very independent puppy. And that might be good for some people. Some people don't like all the cuddling and, and all the over-affection. They find it annoying. So that type of dog may be good for you. Just understand the differences of the behavior, the attitude towards you when they're indifferent. Fearful or just non-caring, okay? So that's the first thing. Again, the second thing we don't wanna see is a puppy who's this and not sure if they should go to you and then cautiously is going to you and then maybe finally gets to you and they're in there and they're cowering and they just don't know how, right and they're very insecure that's already genetic defect okay there is a social issue there. there's a nerve problem there genetic fear base issue and i would avoid that you, as a pet person, want a very confident, social, happy-go-lucky dog, okay? That is your best choice. Another thing, I hear this all the time dealing with the public. A lot of my clients, I'm there because we have a problem with the dog as an adult could tell it's fear-based, 
right? And if you ask them, you know, to get the genetic history on this was either taught by the owners, it was genetic and taught by the owners, is it genetic? So when you went to pick the puppy, what was it doing? No, he was sitting back there all by himself and just sat there, right? So he looked like the smart one to me. <laughs> all the other puppies were trying to engage with us and had crazy and all excitable, and they were just sitting there watching this, thinking the other puppies are crazy. So I liked that it was calmer and just hanging there very innocently. And a lot of times I'm going to get that they thought it was the smarter one of the group because it wasn't acting like a silly puppy. So we have two things to that. It's either one or the other. <laughs> Those puppies that do that are either the alpha, very tough compared to that litter, and doesn't want to show itself to you like that and need you and have to go goo goo over you because it's the leader and it's not going to show you that kind of behavior or it's going to be very timid and it's not going to go there and do that with the other puppies and that's how timid it is because it won't even follow the energy of the other puppies to engage with you that's how timid it is and fearful of social situations so that is not good so most of my clients thousands and thousands and thousands of aggression cases in my career a lot of times I am hearing that that is how they pick the puppy on that criteria that he just sat there in the corner was very you know <laughs> puppy like calm cutie and that's the one they picked big mistake you don't want the alpha generally and you don't want the lowest one and generally that puppy's going to be one or either one of those so that one's eliminated automatically so now also most people in the public understandably pick by look color spot size whatever it is and understandably when you go pick a pup you want something appealing to you in that color and you know <laughs> and you want a pretty dog that appeals to you and that's normal that's okay as a pet dog right if we were picking working dogs that need have a purpose we need to use them for something we're looking for different qualities in that dog and the look doesn't matter it can't matter right even though we want a good-looking dog too when we're picking them for performance but as I'll get into that in a bit but for a pet person they're going oh I like the spot in the eye oh I like that foot color oh I like he's big I like that size you know and not and they're picking the one who has social issues they don't take them out individually to test these things so they get them home and they turn into something else because they're picking on criteria that has nothing to do with the dog itself they're picking the beauty show of the dog and gets a lot of pet dog people in problems and again understandable that they're looking for something appealing it's going to live with them for a long time they want it to be what they wanted that's the envision they had a beautiful dog a good presence whatever it is a certain color and this is why we have a lot of fear based dogs anxious fear aggression antisocial because this is the norm of how people pick a puppy right for their household as a pet one other thing is parents generally for pet dogs you get this all the time where it's not 
Yes, they would like to see the parents and see that they would come out and socialize with you. Doesn't happen all the time. A lot of breeders don't have one of the dogs and somewhere else, another kennel. Sometimes don't get to see the parents at all. They'll see them in pictures or behind a door or in a kennel. Not really knowing what the parents are made of, what their temperaments really are. And it's just the breeder wanting to put those two together because a good majority of breeders in the country are really just breeders and do it for money and are not, they don't know anything about temperament or character or anything like that. They just put, I like that one, I like that one, I'm going to put them together, I think it'll be a good match, right? So a lot of uneducated breeders, mostly in the pet dog industry, part of it. Another criteria people don't look for is the parents to be x-rayed, right? The hips x-rayed, the elbows, the testing, anything like that. Pet dog people do not ask for that criteria. So as far as health goes, there's none of that. The pet dog people don't even think of that. It's not something they, unless it's German Shepherds, that's the only one really you will hear that even if somebody's just going to a pet breeding German Shepherd place, they might go, you know, how about the hips? Oh no, the hips have been fine with no proof of that, right? But no, generations, generations, but the public has heard so much about hip dysplasia in German Shepherds, even the uneducated public, it's just one of those little nuances that they've heard around the world about German Shepherds gone online and all this about hip dysplasia. So that is one thing even an uneducated public will ask a breeder. And most of the time, pet dog German Shepherd breeders don't have any x-rays to prove that or have done any of that because they're not really professional breeders. Okay, so that is another thing. So there's a whole mix of things that you want to be seeing here as a pet dog purchaser. Okay, so for pet dogs, that's really what you're looking for. We're not testing their drive, we're not, you know, testing their food drive or anything like that because performance doesn't matter at all, right? We just care about stability of character you know, or in health, if possible, again, but that's going to be a, a crapshoot once you buy the puppy because, again, most breeders don't do any health testing. Now, let's go over to service dogs because now we're going to up the criteria and service dogs and protection dogs have a similar base, okay? With a little bit of a tweak of character. So with service dogs, we are wanting everything that I just spoke about when purchasing a pet dog puppy. Happy-go-lucky, no nerves, no anxiety, no fear, any of that. What we are going to add to this though now is I want to see a puppy that has very good food drive. I also want to see a puppy that will go chase toys. Good boy. Good boy. Yeah. 
Fetch. Because when we're dealing with service dogs that I have trained my whole life in every way or exercise possible that somebody can request. But I want to make the distinction here of the caliber of service dog. Most people in the country want a service dog or a service dog certificate because they just want the right to be able to take them to a restaurant with them, take them to hotels, take them on a plane. They are looking for this certificate just to get a, a free ride, right? Two places that nobody's going to refuse them being able to travel everywhere with them and be with them all the time, no matter where they go. So that kind of dog, I train all the time, there's no special needs, there's nothing special that the dog has to do, any real exercises. So we don't need the food drive, we don't need prey drive because we're talking about really just a basic obedience dog that has to behave in public, behave on planes and all that in restaurants, right? Basic stuff. Down stays, sit stays, walk properly, don't jump on people, basic training. So when we're picking, you know, that, so the distinction between the two, that kind of service dog, which the majority of people in the country are doing so again to have the right with their dog to go everywhere even though they particularly don't have a medical issue or need the dog to do anything special for them or even if they have a medical issue the dog doesn't need to perform anything for them because their medical issue is not that bad that there's something the dog can do for them okay so we're just going basic obedience basic behavior livable, no nonsense, they're great to travel with, great to go to places with, and will never get kicked out because the dog is unruly and doesn't listen. Okay, so that is your standard American service dog. So when we pick a puppy for that type, we are not looking for drive. It's a basic service dog. It's gonna have nothing special on it. So it doesn't require drive. I'm going to just do all the basics. For a real service dog that is going to perform all sorts of tasks for an owner as a service dog. Hitting handicap buttons to open and close the doors. Fetching things, keys, wallets, all sorts of things to go re find it, retrieve it, and bring it back to them. Open and closing cabinet doors. All different types of things. Yes! Good girl! Pull. There you go, yes! Pull! Yes! Speed racer! Close. Yes, good boy. Pull. Yes. Spiracer, close. Yes, good boy. Speed racer, pull. Yes. Speed racer, close. Yes. Search. Uh, 
Pop. Yes, good boy. Get it. She's bring doing it something. You better pay attention because you're going to be doing this too. <laughs> bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. There you good go. Girl. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Good boy. Wow. Good boy. Good boy. So that was unbelievable. <laughs> With the athleticism and the, the he I mean it was the, will. Determination. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That a girl. That's a good girl. Good girl. Good girl. <laughs> good girl. Yeah. Very good. Good girl. Hey, close it. Good girl. We need a dog that has drive. It has to have food drive first because teaching through play and toys is very difficult, right? So we need a lot of good food drive to have the puppy go crazy and want the food badly. So we know that we can get them to perform high end tasks for the owner because they have the drive to work for something. And then toys come later, right? So when you talk about retrieving, a lot of service dog people who are really handicapped need a dog to go get things and bring it back to them one of the main functions of a real service dog retrieving okay so we're testing that as a puppy throwing ball or a toy to see if they will go get it have the desire to go get it and bring it back criteria absolutely mandatory for a real service dog and that is the harder for the service dog thing is making sure the toy thing right going having drive prey drive to go chase things grab it pick it up and then eventually bring it <clears throat> without that side if we just have good food drive but not toy drive it makes retrieving very difficult okay so that has to be taught then and taking them into a place you have to have good skill as a trainer now to make the puppy care about going to retrieve when it wasn't genetically, he didn't care about running after things. He just wanted food all the time, was food obsessed. And that you take that and manipulate them into caring about retrieving, right? But that takes good skill to do. And I would advise to, to avoid that issue at all costs because now you're just gonna have to have great skill and now you're gonna have to spend time on teaching something on natural for the end when it's not necessary if you just pick a puppy who has all that from the beginning, okay? So that for a service dog, okay, again is all the stuff we talked about, the pet dog we're looking for, but adding 
food drive and prey drive to go chase objects, toys, ball, whatever it is. Okay? We need that to teach the high end service dog skills for a real service dog who has to perform for an owner because without the dog they wouldn't be able to get any of these these things done there might be a wheelchair which we do tons that are wheelchairs that people don't have the ability so very important that that is the kind of puppy you are picking okay when you're going to look for service dog tasks real service dog tasks and this drive also applies to if you are looking for a search and rescue dog right one to go find people okay action max search oh shit same criteria but they had to have the drive right for something food drive at least with this so when the people go hide they have the food then the dog is willing to go search for somebody for its food because its food drive is so high toy drive will help a lot as well so again for a search and rescue dog there has to be drive and a lot of my clients want a dog their dog or a dog they purchase from me to even if it's a pet like a, a service dog or a companion trained dog they would like to have the bonus of that dog searching for a family member if they feel they got lost okay so we need that drive food drive and bonus would be if we have toy drive for that okay so drive comes into play again for anything of performance or work oriented protection dogs we need the same thing again the same base as the pet dog service dog with 
Now, the same thing as a service dog. Ball chasing, playing with the rag. We want to see the going after the rag and grabbing it and playing a little tug of war. Okay, we want to see a little bit of, a, of prey aggression, right? Don't need that for the service dog, but for the protection dog. We want all the above from the first two categories, adding now a chase of the rag and, and getting tuggy with it and, you know, a little bit aggressive with it. And that will differ, too, just for people to understand. For the most part, when we're picking puppies, Malinois and Dutch Shepherds, when you see them young, playing with rags or on a you know, puppy sleeve, a bite pillow, you're going to hear a lot of rawr, 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 right? a natural aggression when they get in that drive, right? Real aggression, even young, very young. German Shepherds, you don't see that often, right? Rottweilers, Dobermans, you do see it quite a bit in the bully breeds, right? Even boxers, where right? I've done a lot of boxer puppies and, they're, and they get a little bit of that too going. They have a little bit of that nasty in them too. But that's the bully side, okay, of those types generally. But Malinois and Dutch Shepherds have that natural tenacity because, again, like I spoke about in what are the best protection dogs? Number one are both in the world, hands down. Malinois and Dutch Shepherds are hands down the number one performing protection dogs on the planet. And that is because for a hundred and plus years, genetic and genetic, genetic, genetic of just hardcore working dogs. Insane drive, adding tenacity. They want tough dogs for police work in, in Holland, Belgium, right? Adding these very tenacious, tough genetics. German Shepherds, I put as number two, which I love just as much, 
just a little difference in the breeding over the years, the amount of time as well. The sport has differentiated. Shepherds take a little longer to mature, right? So most Malawas Dutch Shepherds can, a lot of times, just general, eight, ten months old, they have the true tenacity to get on a police force or have a, or a protection dog for a home, and they will fight somebody for real. They don't need to be mature. That is their maturity. Most German Shepherds, to really fight, right, and have that maturity to take somebody on a year and a half, a lot of times two, it doesn't truly come out. And it happens to us all the time where we'll build the drives playfully, but they don't have the fight yet. And at two years old, all of a sudden the, the, the switch flips and now it's tenacious. Now they're ready to fight because they have mental maturity now in the game. Now it's for real. It's not just tugging and play biting anymore. It, now we've turned, they've turned the corner. Rottweilers later. Okay, so there's just a difference in the genetics and the look. So a lot of our German Shepherd puppies, when we do this, they'll go after it. They'll tug on it. They love to play with it. That's the kind of puppy we're looking for. Just not generally with the tenacity that the young Malinois have in the Dutch Shepherds and a lot of the other breeds. But that's all fine. It doesn't matter, right? German Shepherds, Rottweilers, they're all great dogs. But picking, we need to see for many of the breeds, chasing a ball, getting with that rag and tugging on it and wanting to play tug of war and really getting into it. There's another test, picking them up and holding them. If, you know, like a human baby, them looking up. And this has been a criteria for a long time in the industry. How much they fight, do they want to be there and let you hold them like that passively? The rule has been, if they fight very quickly and just want to get out, great working prospect, tougher puppy. Then you get the middle one who will hang in there a little bit, fight a little bit, hang in there a little bit, fight a little bit, and still decent, right? The one who just lays there and sits there and just lets you cuddle them and do all that and with no fight is, has always been dubbed as the one that you don't want, that doesn't have enough fight, enough drive, right? Now, I personally don't base on that. I don't go by that criteria. I go by the drive of the tug of war, the ball throwing, food drive. I'm going by that. Because then I'll just take that and mold it into what I want out of that dog, right? Uh, if it doesn't have good defense drive, you know, as a puppy, it's not showing that like on the rag, all of that kind of tenacity, that's all fine. Because as that puppy grows, even genetically, if it didn't have a true fight, but it loves to tug and play and prey drive, I will mold that dog into having defense drive later and turn the skills or the genetics it gave me of chasing a ball and having that prey drive and turn it into a true protection dog that now has the fence drive. I will build it into them. Okay, so, but that is the criteria we're looking for as a protection dog. Different than the service dog where we want some tugging on the rag and a little bit of aggression. To really fight the rags and hold on to the bite pillows and all that kind of stuff. Where a service dog, we don't really need that. We would like to see a little bit of that because if we want to open doors, you know, using rags and all that, it helps to have puppies that want to play tug of war, even golden retrievers, any of those breeds. So it helps. Not necessary, I'll get them to do it as long as they have drive, but I would like that also in a service dog. Now, other thing with protection dogs. For me personally, I don't care, right? Unlike the rest of the world, I don't care 
if the parents have any titles, sport titles or anything else. I don't care. I do buy a lot of dogs that the parents have titles on them because I have no choice, right? <laughs> and unfortunately, we don't have a society like an association of real protection dogs that prove protection, which I'm thinking of creating, that we can pick right from real protection dogs that do that in life, either on the police department, military, personal protections for homes, family, right, that are balanced, stable, but we know without titles and having to care about that, that these genetics, all this pool of genetics has that without having titles for a hundred years. Doesn't matter. So that is really my criteria. So if I see two good dogs, the parents are good and they're actually protection dogs and they really do it, I don't care about titles. I'll take a puppy from those two. Okay, another thing. We want the parents of these working puppies, protection puppies, to have certifications on their hips, elbows, health, right? Any genetic diseases or anything like that that a breed is known for, we want to make sure that the parents are clear of this before purchasing a puppy from anybody. So hips x-rayed, the elbows, the OFA certifications. This should be done on pet dog parents, service dog parents, protection dog parents. Period should be done on all to guarantee quality of health and longevity, right? It should be a mandatory thing anybody who's breeding. But again, in pet dogs, Rarely you get that. So that is another criteria I have before I purchase dogs or puppies from certain parents. Okay, so really when picking a puppy for any of the categories, it's not that complicated. Right, you just need to check some certain basic foundation things depending on what category you're picking, what you want, pet, service dog, protection dog. There's criteria that's similar to all three and then little adjustments to the other ones, but nothing out of this world complicated to judge, okay? So you get these basic things, and if you're a good trainer and know your stuff, you can do amazing things with the service dog search and rescue protection category, right? So it's just getting your base and having that clay you can mold into something phenomenal. But you need these certain characteristics to be able to get there and have this genetic base to work from and to make your life easy and not have to struggle and try to make dogs do that, which in my career I've had to do because people pick the wrong dogs. And then I have to come up with things how to get that dog who doesn't care or have the genetics to do that exercise. And it happens to me all the time. So I've had to come up with a lot of things and different ways in psychology to get dogs who genetically don't have it to perform then to perform. So if you know what you're doing, you can overcome a lot of things like that, but I wouldn't advise it. Start with the genetic base, look for these certain things as criteria, and then mold everything you want from there. And things will be easy, you'll get phenomenal results, and it's all about genetics and picking the right puppies. Okay, that is what it's all about. Genetics matter, matter, matter. It is very important.
So, I am Richard Hines. I hope that was helpful because I've been asked this for a long time and I've just never gone through it like this and explained the process and what I look for and how I go about it and, and all the criteria to it. So that is how to pick a puppy for all the categories. Until next time, I'm Richard Hines and I'll see you in the next video.